Bienvenidos, Ushamdi, and welcome CTS 230, Section 841 students for the first eight-week term of the fall 2017 semester at Anne Arundel Community College. This is the Networking 3 course, or the Cisco Networking Academy Scaling Networks V6 course. And this morning's video tutorial and solution set is going to be on Packet Tracer Activity 7.2, dot three dot five where we're actually going to be able to troubleshoot some EIGRP issues. So let's go ahead and take a look at our environment here. You can see we've got this ubiquitous triangle that we're often faced with where we've got three routers, routers one, two, and three. Router two is our connectivity out to the internet, right? And here's the outside host we're going to be testing connectivity to. So we're simply going to troubleshoot some EIGRP issues here. And then we're going to document the problems. Now, interestingly enough, they present us with three uh, spaces here for identifying the issues. So there's a very good possibility that there might be one issue uh, wrong with each of these routers. And then we'll have to sort that out. So let's go ahead. Uh, I'm just going to start down here. We'll start with R1 LAN. So we'll go in, in order. I'm going to pull the PC up. We'll get the desktop PC up here. And we'll get our command prompt. And let's go ahead and see, can we ping out to 64.100.1.10? All right, so what are we getting here? Well, we're getting that ICMP destination unreachable response. And who are we getting it from? When we look at this, you can see the reply is coming from our default gateway. Now, remember, uh, and let's go ahead and show that that's the default gateway here. If I pull the IP config up, you can see 172.31.10.1. And if we look up here, we can see the gig 00 interface on router one. That is our default gateway. Now, from our previous excursions with the IGRP, we found out that it's possible that maybe R1, our default gateway, doesn't have a default gateway that can get us to that network. So let's kind of do the follow the path troubleshooting methodology here. So we start out here on, on, on PC1. In fact, if I came back to PC1 and I said, okay, well, let's make sure that it's not a PC1 issue. I can ping 172.31. What was that? 10.1. So can I ping my default gateway? And I can. So I'm getting ICMP reply packets back, which tells me that I'm able to go from the PC to router one. But it's once we leave router one where we're having some problems. So let's take a look at that. Let's pull router one up here. And let's see if router one can ping that outside address. And so we'll go from user exec to privilege exec using that enable command. And we'll say ping 64.100 dot, and I covered it up, and I've forgotten it already, 1.10, 1.10. And so we see if we can ping, and nothing. So now that we know that we can't ping from the router, let's take a look and see, does this router have any information here for the 64100 network. And you can see the gateway of last resort is not set. And we know that this might be an issue uh, because we don't know how to get out of our enterprise, right? Out of this autonomous system. You can see that, in fact, taking a look over here, what do you notice? Yeah, there's no EIGRP learned information here. So we've got directly connected networks that we know about, and we don't know about any EIGRP information. And this should be a red flag. So we've followed the path, starting at PC1, coming to router one, and now we're kind of getting into the EIGRP portion of the troubleshooting. So now we need to investigate. Let's do a quick show run. Now, if I was on a real Cisco router, what I would do is say, show run, pipe it to section, router EIGRP. But a packet tracer doesn't um, it doesn't acknowledge, doesn't recognize that command. So we're kind of stuck with the show run. So I'll say show run. Let's see what we have configured here. All right. So we've got router EIGRP 11. We've got the passive interface command. And then we've got 
uh, the three network statements. Well, let's see. Show run interface EIGRP. I'm sorry. Uh, show interface uh, EIGRP. Show IP EIGRP interfaces. There we go. Apologize there. So you can see we've got it running on the two networks that are the serial interfaces, and we are EIGRP 11. So what about show IP EIGRP neighbors? Right, so I don't have any neighbors. And this answers the question as to why I'm not learning about any of these LAN segments, uh, router two and router three. So looking at the process ID number, right, this process, I'm sorry, the autonomous system number says EIGRP process 11. So the autonomous system number 11, right, we haven't worked with 11 a lot. We've typically worked with autonomous system one. So it's possible that we don't have the same autonomous system number as the other routers here. So let's check router two and let's see what we've got here. So we come to router two, we'll go from user exec to privilege exec. I'm gonna say show IP EIGRP neighbors. Aha, so IP EIGRP neighbors for process one, you'll notice that we have none. There's no neighbors. So let's say show IP EIGRP interfaces. And we look, it looks like we're only configured on that one serial interface, right? And you can clearly see that in the autonomous system, or what should be our autonomous system here, which is going to be right in here, it looks like we probably should be autonomous system number one. And of course, both of those interfaces should be running EIGRP, but we see that it's only one interface. And so now let's go ahead and take another peek at the EIGRP configuration section here with the show run. And you can see we're EIGRP one, and it looks like we're redistributing a static route Right? And so this is going to help with the reachability for router 1, and I should say for PC1 and router 1, just this whole setup here. Uh, and we've got the two network statements, but we're missing uh, the network statement for, it would appear, uh, 172.31.228 for this network right here. Right, So that is missing. So that's kind of low-hanging fruit. So we're going to knock that out right now. So let's get into global config router EIGRP1, and then let's add in that missing network statement. Because again, if we know and understand how EIGRP is supposed to function, right, where we need to be running the EIGRP process on the interface where we would like to have an EIGRP neighbor adjacency formed, we need to make sure we have that network statement in place. So 172.31.40. dot, and this is kind of nice, they give us the network ID, right? So it makes it a little easier for us. Now we see a slash 30. We know that the wildcard mask, whoops, the wildcard mask is going to be the inverse of what the net mask would be in dotted decimal notation. So 0 .0 0.0.0.3. In fact, if we look down here in the lower right hand corner, my guess is we're going to be rewarded with a few points. Whoa, 33 points, in fact. All right, so the neighbor adjacency is up with router three. So this clearly solved one of the issues that we had. You can see we had this redistribute static, and this was for redistributing into EIGRP, because again, consider this kind of our border router, right? Again, when we look at this topology, this, everything to the left, this is my inside network, I'll just put an I here, and then everything out here, and this line here could probably should have drug over there to include router three, or I'm sorry, uh, um, R1 LAN switch and the little PC here, but you get the idea. And this is the outside, right? So this is the internet, okay? And so this is the only interface and the only path out of the inside enterprise network to reach the internet. And so it makes sense that router two is going to be responsible for redistributing that static default route that we've configured right here, right? In order to tell the other EIGRP speaking routers that, hey, 
if you don't know where you're, if you've got, you're receiving traffic for a destination that you don't have a specific entry for, here's the default route that you should be using. Just come to me and I'll take care of everything else from there, right? So let's go ahead and clear this here and go back back to the command line. So we've got that taken care of. Now we've seen it's EIGRP1. So let's take a look at router three because the question we're asking now is we know that router one has the wrong autonomous, well actually let me, let me correct what I'm saying there. So we know that router one and router two do not have matching autonomous system numbers. And so now we need to take a look at router three to determine should it be router EIGRP1 or should it be router EIGRP 11? And we're gonna go with whatever router three has configured, and it should be one because we saw that adjacency come up. And so there we go right there. So we'll go into privilege exec, we'll say show run, and it does show router EIGRP one. And this is typically the autonomous system that we've worked with in our previous activity. So two is autonomous system one, three is autonomous system one. So you know, again, it will work both ways. If we changed two and three to 11, it would work, right? But my guess is they're not gonna give you the points for that because does that make sense to change it on these two routers as opposed to simply changing one router, router one, so that it is EIGRP autonomous system one. And so we're gonna go into global config. Now, this could be, um, a little bit of work to do if you're gonna type it in manually, but I'm gonna say no router EIGRP one. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come up here and I'm just gonna grab all of the EIGRP configuration that we would need. And I'm gonna say router EIGRP one, and then I'm gonna paste this in, right? And so we have, and it looks like there may be, you know, I'll have to check what's going on here between these guys, uh, 232, 172, 31, 40, 232. So that is good. So my guess is when we go back to router three, right, you can see we've got this one adjacency. So let's let's do this. Do show IP EIGRP neighbors, right? And did I miss? Oh, it looks like we did get a second one there. Or no, we've only got, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. We did get the second one. I missed that. All right, so we're good. So both of the neighbor adjacencies are there. So everything looks good. Uh, did we have, so passive interface gig zero zero, and that looks good. So now if I was to say do show IP route, you can see here is the EIGRP candidate for a default route. It's external EIGRP information. Therefore, the administrative distance is going to be 170. Again, this is external, right, externally learned or externally originated routing information from a routing protocol, in this case, the static protocol, which was injected, inserted into the EIGRP autonomous system. So it is foreign routing information that has been inserted, injected into the EIGRP autonomous system, into our neighborhood, right? And it's foreign to our neighborhood, to our autonomous system. And therefore, we are going to say that it is less trustworthy with an administrative distance of 170 than internally, right? Locally learned, I'm trying to highlight this here, locally learned EIGRP information that's learned from within our autonomous system. We trust this information more than we do information that we are learning from outside of the autonomous system, right? Think of it as like, uh, you know, the new guy that wanders into town and nobody's really quite sure, you know, who he is or where he's from. And so we're going to treat them a little bit differently by giving them an administrative distance of 170, less trustworthy than information we're learning internally from inside our little click here, our little uh, neighborhood. All right. So should we be able to ping 64.100.1.10? Let's see what happens. All right, so we've got connectivity out, but we've still got some work to do here because you can see we've only got 67 out of 100. My guess is the next 33 that we get is going to push us over the top. So 
What are the issues so far? Well, the first issue was router one had the wrong EIGRP autonomous system number. We've taken care of that. Router two was missing the network statement for the transit segment, right? This is a transit segment here between router two and router three and it was missing its network statement. So we had an issue on router two, an issue on router one. So now let's step over and take a look here at router three, and let me give us a little more real estate to work with. So on router, whoops, on router three, if I was to say show IP EIGRP neighbors, let's see, do I have both of my neighbors? I do, and so those neighbor relationships are up. What about a show IP route? I'm learning that routing information and show IP interface brief. Let me take a look here at the LAN segment, 172.31.30, and we've got the two serial interfaces and that looks good. So let's make sure that we're advertising. And I could say show IP EIGRP interfaces. And so that looks good. So let's come over to PC3 and let's see, can PC3 reach out to the internet? So 64.100.1.10. All right, we've got connectivity there. What about the R2 LAN? Let's check here. And we'll say ping 64.100.1.10. So we've got connectivity there. And so the PCs appear to be able to reach the internet with no issue, but there's still an outstanding problem here. And if we look at router three, we've got the passive gig, oh, okay. So we've got the passive interface gig zero, zero. I was focused on these networks uh, statements here, but what's the problem on router three that we don't have in the configuration section here on router one, I'm sorry, on router two and on router one respectively. And when we look at both of these, if I was to say, do show IP protocols, right? And automatic summarization is disabled. And this is what we want. Now it's interesting that auto summary is on here, but it's not impacting the flow of traffic right now. So if I were to say show IP protocols, and you can see that automatic summarization is enabled. And we want to disable that because we are doing variable length subnet masking, right? We could have a, a situation where we have discontiguous uh, network segments. In other words, segments that don't run together uh, in some sort of an IP address order, right? Where it's everything is nice and clean. Uh, so we want to make sure that we turn that off. So let's go into global config router EIGRP1, and we're going to say no auto summary, right? And you can see that's going to resync things, and that's going to bring us back to 100 out of 100. Now, I'm going to give you an additional question here to troubleshoot. So let's work this out. So the requirement is, is that PC1, if I was to say, trace route to 64.100.1.10. You can see that I go, and let me give us a little more room here. That way we don't have this, or can we do that here in the command window? We can, there we go. So we wanna take a look at this. So where do we go? We go to 172.31.10.1. We know that that's our default gateway. We know that that's router one, but then where does router one go? It goes to 172.31.40.226. And the reason that it goes there, if I come back over here to the routing table and we say show IP route EIGRP, you can see that we've learned the default and we're learning it from both router two and router three. If I was to say show IP EIGRP topo, what would we see on router one? And it looks like it's showing a single feasible via R static. Okay, so it's learned it from a redistributed static and it gives us our, what we're gonna go by is the feasible distance right now and there is the reported distance. So let me see EIGRP topo, we'll say all links, right? So we've got that single advertisement there, right? And that is our next hop, which means coming this way, right? It didn't meet 
the feasibility condition. And that R static, again, when you see that R static, it means redistributed static right here. Right? That's what that R static means for this default route. So what if, what if I wanted to go from R1 to R3 to R2? Right? What if I wanted to do some layer 3 traffic engineering here on router 1 to change it so that the preferred path is to come this way? And I'm hoping that Packet Tracer, again, kind of ad-libbing here, hoping that Packet Tracer is going to uh, respect and honor what I'm getting ready to do here. So how would you do that? How would we make this path here along the bottom appear to be more preferred than this path here going that way. How do I change that? Exactly. Remember, there's two metrics that are being used right now. It's the K1, which is our bandwidth. I'm drawing with my mouse here, so hold, hang with me. And then K3, which is the delay. So these, by default, are the two multipliers, the two composite metric values that we're using by default on router one. If I was to say show IP protocol is a great place to look to see this, here they are right here, metric weight, K1, K3. So the load K2 and the reliability, which is both K4 and K5, those are not on, right? Those are not factored into the equation. So let's take a look and let's see, show interface, and I think it's serial 000. zero, zero. And it is, and you can see that, and we're kind of learning this now, we should kind of be recognizing that when we see these serial links here in Packet Tracer, that the bandwidth is 1544 kilobits per second. So T1, 1.544 megabits per second, but we're interested in the kilobits per second. And then we've got the delay here, right? And the delay is 20,000, and we've seen that before. And we know that the delay on a gig interface, I believe was 10, and we saw that earlier. So the delay is 20,000 here. So from router one's perspective, the outgoing interfaces, right, those egress interfaces on the way to the destination, that is the value that's being used. So I could change the bandwidth, right, of the outgoing and one, one of the outgoing interfaces to make it look worse or it's possible that I could change the delay to manipulate things. And so this is a question very common that learners have is, well, should I change the bandwidth or should I change the delay? Which one should I change and why? And it's very, very easy to remember this. Always, always, always manipulate the delay. The only time that you would change the bandwidth from an EIGRP perspective, would be to accurately reflect the speed of the link. And what do I mean when I say that? And let me get my pen here. This mouse uh, is not working for me when I'm drawing. So here's what I mean. So we can see that these are 1.544 uh, kilobits or 1.544 megabits per second or 1,544 kilobits per second, which is basically just a T1, right? Now, what if this was a fractional T1? What if this was 128 kilobits per second, right? It's still, the, the router is going to recognize it as a serial connection. It's going to clock it and set it at 1.544, or I should, let me just do kilobits. It's going to clock it at 1544 kilobits per second. But we're playing with a fractional, like a piece, a slice, right, that you would use a multiplexer to accomplish, right? This is very common, uh, especially in older environments. So 128 kilobits per second, if that's the case, we would go into that interface right there, and we would say bandwidth 128, right? Bandwidth 128 to make it, a, to, to accurately reflect what it is. So here's why you would only manipulate the bandwidth in that case, because if you're going to do layer 3 traffic engineering with EIGRP, and the same goes with OSPF, you want to use delay with EIGRP and cost with OSPF. You do not want to start changing the link speeds, because what if you're using QoS, quality of service? 
you changing the bandwidth on the interface could impact the quality of service and how it's going to behave, right? Because if we're trying to make this link look worse and we start to lower the actual, we go below what the actual link speed is, that could have a negative impact on some QoS that we may have running, right? And we don't want to do that. So that's why with both OSPF and EIGRP, never, never, never manipulate the bandwidth in order to do traffic engineering. Only manipulate the bandwidth setting on an interface when you're doing it to accurately reflect the speed of that interface, right? So these guys are all 1544. We're going to leave them at 1544. And what that means is we're going to go ahead and manipulate the delay. So let's go ahead and see what happens here. And hopefully Packet Tracer is going to play nice and cooperate. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, the do show IP interface brief, what interface is that? So interface brief. So the interface that I want to make appear less attractive, right? I want to make it look bad is going to be that link between router one and router two. And so when we look here, uh, we can see that that is going to be serial zero, zero, zero. So if I go into interface serial zero, 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 and I say delay, and now remember, we're entering in tens of microseconds here. So I'm just going to grab this, and let's go copy and paste, and we'll make it one less than the maximum. And you can see that we changed the delay, right? So EIGRP is going to need the diffusing update algorithm, that finite state machine, has recognized that the delay, one of the values that I'm using to determine the best path has changed. And so that is going to cause, and it, it would have changed no matter, well, I shouldn't say no matter what I change it to, but as I make it higher like this to make it worse, EIGRP is going to have to rerun, right? The diffusing update algorithm is going to have to rerun, and it's going to have to reset and give us another look at those metrics. So let's see, do show IP route EIGRP. Oh, and you got to love it when a plan comes together. Take a look at this. So now, which interface are we going out? Exactly. We're going out the serial 001 interface. So now when I come over here, let's rerun that trace route command. And now, which way are we going? Exactly. Our second hop is now to the 234. It now goes to router 3, where here, <clears throat> excuse me, when we left it by default, it was going to router 2. And so this is how you do layer 3 traffic engineering with EIGRP. Now, we need to be careful here in this triangle, right? Because we're manipulating it for router 1, and 1 knows, yeah, I come to router 3 now. So we wouldn't want to change router 3 and say, oh, yeah, you go to router 1, because 1 is going to come back to 3, 3 is going to go to 1. So we need to be careful. So again, that's why we're only working with that individual scenario here that the requirement is all traffic from the R1 LAN needs to transit router 3 on its way to the Internet. And again, the K1 and K3 composite metric values, those multipliers that we can manipulate, bandwidth K1, delay K3, we want to go into the interface and always, always, always manipulate delay with EIGRP, always, always, always manipulate cost with OSPF doing your traffic engineering. The only time you want to use that bandwidth command is to accurately reflect the true speed of the link. And typically that'll come into play when you've got some sort of a fractional T1 link, 128 kilobits a second, 512 kilobits a second, 768, 1024, right? So that's where you want to make sure you make that change to accurately reflect the speed of the link. All right, so we went a little outside the box, but very important topic to talk about understanding how we manipulate 
and engineer traffic at layer three with EIGRP. All right, well, that is going to wrap up Packet Tracer Activity 7.2.3.5. We did a little troubleshooting. We saw that we wanted to turn auto summary off. We wanted to make sure we have all the network statements properly set up. And we saw that you have to have matching autonomous system numbers because Router 1 was not going to participate in the EIGRP autonomous system. All right, guys, thanks for watching. Enjoy the weather out there today, and I will see you on Tuesday.